Praise you, God. If you have a Bible, open to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. So over the next four, five, six weeks, or whenever I feel like finishing, depending on how God leads me, I'm going to talk about relationships. I'm going to talk about marriage. The title of the series is Better or Worse. And then some of you are saying, it's, I got a lot more worse than better, Pastor. <laughs> Amen. As I was praying about the, the series and asking God to help me through it, and God gave me the title because as I was thinking about it, a lot of people today, those, those words, better or worse, come from a traditional, a traditional marriage, right? It's a traditional marriage vow. Sickness and health, richer or poor, um, better or worse, and then we say, to death do us part. And I tell people, one of the things I do now, I do, I do premarital counseling, and then I learned that I do premarital, premarital counseling. That's just because the generation we're living in. And I tell people, they're not just words. They're not just words. Now, if you're not married, you need to be here for all five or six parts of this series so you can understand, because one day you might get married. And so, so you can understand what's involved for you to get married. Amen? If you're married, um, you need to be here also for all five or six parts so you can understand and be reminded what, it, what, is, what is it that God has called us to do to be married. So as I was praying and asking God, and today the title is called Follow the Bubbles. Say follow. Repeat after me. Say follow. follow. You know, a few years ago, I've been, I've been snorkeling a few times. I went snorkeling in the Dominican Republic. Now, I couldn't see nothing there, I'll be honest. I was trying to snorkel, trying to catch a, uh, one of those big, big uh, shells. I don't know what those big shells are called. Conch shells. Yeah, I was trying to, I couldn't see none. All I got was dirt. But that's all right, all right? But then I went snorkeling two years ago in Grand Turk. It's a little island outside of the Bahamas. And when I, I thought I was in the Bahamas, when I told the guy, yo, this is Bahamas, and he got really mad and said, this is not Bahamas, this is Grand Turk. All right, so if you ever go to Grand Turk, don't say it's from Bahamas because they'll get mad at you. It's Grand Turk, all right? So I went snorkeling, snorkeling there. And so we put the mask on with the little tube and we began to go out and we had the flappers, the flippers. So we're going out and you're kind of hovering, you're hovering right there and you're flopping out. And I used to be in better shape. I remember being able to flap out and flap back in, no problem. And this time I went, I was actually looking to my son to rescue me. I mean, I was like, man, Isaiah was like a machine going through that water. He surprised me how strong he is, you know. And, and he's like looking at me like, you know, Dad, you're annoying me. And I'm like, Dad, I'm, boy, I'm drowning. Get over here. Save your father. Well, what's wrong with you? So I'm, it was nice because we, we went out flapping our, our flippers. And we're going out and the, the sand is right there. And you could see that. You could see right down. And then it drops. As you just, it just drops. Maybe five, six, eight feet, ten feet. And you look down and you see all these different fishes. Just, just going around, and, and you don't realize, but there you can actually, certain parts of the water, uh, you, certain parts of the water, you just stick your head right down, and you look in, and there's massive fish swimming all around you. But when you're swimming, you don't notice it, but you look down, and there they are, swimming all around you, right there, right? But I heard this young kid talking about he went scuba diving, and I'm listening to this kid. I'm sorry, he happened to be a white kid. You know, those white people be doing some crazy stuff, I'll be honest with you. I mean, I was scared enough this snorkeling, and this kid was, and he was bragging about scuba diving and looking for sharks and, and the stingrays. I'm like, this kid, this kid is crazy. You know, and, and, they, and they began to tell, I heard him talking about how the scuba diver instructor said, sometimes you go so deep, it gets black. It gets real black, and you have to be able to, you're gonna be disoriented, but you have to be able to figure out and not panic which way is up. So what the scuba diver instructor said was, you look for the bubbles, because bubbles always go up. So you may be under there and it's real black and you're not sure 
which way is up, and you can get disoriented, but you gotta take a minute and feel, because you can't really see, you have to feel the bubbles and which way is up, and then you follow up so you can save yourself. So this morning, I'm gonna talk to you about marriage, better or worse, but the first thing I wanna talk to you about is following the bubbles. Are you listening to me? All right, and so before I talk to you about uh, marriage and, and, and one, of the, one of the titles of, of one of the, the, the messages I'm gonna give is titled, anyone who's ever been married for any period of time, one of the things you will hear coming out of the other person's mouth is, that's not my job. So we're gonna talk about that. What is, what is, that's not my job. All right, so there's certain things, but before I even get there and talk about any of that stuff, we gotta follow the bubbles. I have to start with the basics of, of, of what are we following when it comes to relationship and marriage? What are we following? Hebrews chapter 11, are you there? I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter four, chapter four, verse 11. Do you see it? Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the example of disobedience. Here's, here's, here's our theme verse, church. This is the theme verse for this church. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have, we have to do. Right? NIV puts it a little different. Follow the bubble. So what's the first thing the writers to the Hebrews is telling this group of Christians, Jewish Christians, what is the first thing he's telling them that they want to quit? They want to quit following God because they're afraid. And what is the first thing he says? You need to follow the right examples. Verse 11. Verse 11. You need to follow the right examples. We're all following somebody. And most of us are following the wrong examples. The way you dress for the most part is you learn that from somewhere. You learn that from somewhere. The way you act. You learn that from somewhere. We've all had examples in our lives, and the writers to the Hebrews says to them, basically, you didn't follow the right examples, and you were disobedient. He's giving them a warning. And I want you to think about the examples you've had in your life. So I have to start here. First of all, I got to start here with the Word of God. And the Word of God is, is in the Word of God, we have examples of good and bad. And this writer is telling these people, are you following the right examples? Are you listening to me? We all follow somebody. We all are learning from someone. I don't care how old you are. The truth is, you allow somebody to influence your lives. Now, they say, for the most part, most people, they let the TV influence them. Now, our kids, we worry about the people that are in their lives influencing them, right? We know that because they're at school and they're around people in the neighborhood and in school. And we know that, that kids have a tendency to be influenced by other kids. Are you listening to me? But you know what they say? The number one influencer in our children's lives still is mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy, our kids will follow, listen to me, our examples before they follow our advice. Now, not to put my father out there, but he said one or two things over the years that were very good. I don't want to give him a big head. His head's big already, so I don't want to give him the big head, all right? But the truth is, you can't tell your kids, right, not to curse if you curse, not to smoke if you smoke. If, whatever you do, you can't tell them not to do because your example is more powerful than your advice. Are you, li are you listening to me? We can rattle off advice all day, but only when our kids see our advice in action does it hit home. Whatever we expect of them, we must expect of ourselves. 
to be a better parent, to be better parents, we must first be better people. And how does that happen? How does that happen if not, if we, if we have to decide as Christians that the examples we're going to follow, the bubbles that we're going to follow are the bubbles of the word of God. The examples in the word of God. Are you listening to me? That's what we have to follow. The Bible is God's way to warn us and to give us examples. He gives the church a warning here. Hebrews chapter 4. Back it up a few verses. He begins to tell them about certain people. Moses being one. Moses, he says, is an example to them of what happens when you disobey. He says to people, don't, don't, don't listen, don't not listen to God. Follow the right examples. And he, he gives the example of Moses and the children of Israel coming out of, out of bondage and coming out of slavery. And as they're he heading into the promised land, because of their disobedience and wanting to be like everyone else, they, they had to stay in the wilderness for 40 years. He's, the word that's, that, that's given over and over again is they didn't find rest. This writer says they had no rest. They had no rest. So they're, they're not following the right example. When you don't follow the right examples and you keep following Wendy Williams or whoever else is out there to give you advice about relationships, you're not going to find rest. Why would you want to follow Hollywood anyway? Their marriages don't last but two or three years. So why, well, Pastor, what makes you such an authority on marriage? First of all, I've been married for like 27, 28 years. I think I got something to say about marriage. And on second of all, which should be the first of all, is I'm following the word of God. There's a proverb that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Now, what we, what we, what we hang on in that verse is trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's the only part we read. That's the only part we read because we think that means my heart and I got to trust my heart and I trust in the Lord to give me what my heart wants. But that's not what the verse is saying. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And what he's telling you is you can't follow the example of your heart. See, that's the second thing people say. I still, every once in a while, I go to these places, and one of the, the slogans I see is, follow your heart, believe in your heart. Don't follow your heart. Don't believe in your heart, because the Bible says, who can know the heart and it's desperately wicked? See, see what I'm saying? If you follow your heart, you're going to dig yourself into a pit. Now, Pastor, you talking about marriage? I am. But before I get to any of those other things, I need to kind of set a platform, a diving board, board here. I have to set it up for you to realize over the next five or six weeks, I'm not going to give you my opinion, but I'm going to tell you what God says. And today I'm telling you, when it gets dark and you get disoriented, follow the bubbles. And God's word gives you examples of people who disobeyed and what happened and who obeyed and what happened. Are you listening to me? Moses, Moses being an example. Because of their disobedience, they had to wander. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And then there's a, there's a passage here, a little verse here, that it says about David is our example. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. You listening to me? If you hear his voice, he says, don't harden your heart. And he used, he used the teaching here of David. David, that, that, that your heart can be hard. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. Verse 15. What is he talking about? Right now, I'm speaking to you, but God is speaking through me to you. Amen? And I'm telling you, follow the right examples. A hard heart is a person that everything that I just finished saying is going to ignore. That's a hard heart. A hard heart it's going to be a person that says, I don't care what you say. <coughs> I'm going to do it my way. You're not following the bubbles. You're not following the examples that God has given us in his word. He gives <coughs> Moses as an example. He gives David, he says, as an example. A couple weeks ago, I told you, David had some issues. Killed a man, committed adultery. He had some issues. But God calls him a man after his own heart. Why? Because he was a repentant man. He owned his stuff. When he messed up, he realized and he confessed 
that he messed up. He didn't blame the woman that you gave me. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? He gives the example of Joshua. This is, these are the examples. God's words are example. God's word is an example of those who obeyed and those who disobeyed. And those who obey are blessed. And those who disobey never find rest. They wander in the wilderness. They wander in the wilderness. I don't know how many relationships J-Lo's got to have. But you see her on TV and you admire her and she's glamorous. That is an empty soul. That is a person who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you when she's done with A-Rod and give it time, she will be. She'll find somebody else. But she's following her heart. She's not following God's word. You got to follow the bubbles. You listening to me? You got to follow the bubbles. And God's word, it, 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 there is examples of those who followed. And when you follow the, the, the right things, you're blessed. When you follow the wrong things, you're not blessed. Are you listening to me? He talks about Joshua. Joshua, he was that, that kid that took over from Moses and he was afraid. You know the story. He was afraid. Amen. This week, I was with the Amish. Those Amish are some funny people, let me tell you. But they got good ice cream. Check out the ice cream. They got good ice cream. And I got that plaque. That plaque I put over front of the church there on the top, on the other side. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I got that from them. And then they got that from Joshua. And Joshua, one of the last chapters, and here the Hebrew, the writer to the Hebrew, he talks about now Joshua is an example. And you know the story that when they get into the promised land, and now the children of Israel have to follow through with what God had said. Amen? And Joshua says to them, he don't force his way on nobody. But he says, you have to decide who you're going to follow. If you're going to follow the examples of the word, or you're going to follow the examples of the world. This is what Joshua says. And then Joshua says, at the end of it, at the end of this, this passage of scripture, when he tells them, you decide who you're going to follow, the idols and the gods of the world, or you're going to follow God. And he ends it with this. But as for me and my house, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I remember as a kid, when I heard that, I thought that was such a machoism and such a, 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 a dogmatic and, and such a, like, a, a, a pig-headed thing to say. I don't think that no more because it's God's word. Amen. And so here the writer to the Hebrews is telling these people who want to quit being Christians, are you following the right examples? He says, look at Moses, look at Joshua, look at David. And Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Are you listening? Following God's biblical truth will bring rest. A blessing only comes to the people that obey God's word and believe God's word. word. Difficulty or more difficulty comes to those people who don't believe God's word and who don't obey God's word. Are oh, you listening to me? The truant Kathy answered the question for his life, what would Jesus do? Truett Kathy was the founder of Chick-fil-A. In 1948, he decided to start a group of restaurants called Chick-fil-A because he believed God's word and he trusted God's word he did what everyone else thought he should not have done. To this day, you cannot go to Chick-fil-A on Sundays because he believed that Chick-fil-A belongs and Sunday belongs to God. Go to Chick-fil-A and you're going to see his clothes. He started this back in 1948. He said, I'm going to honor God. In 1940 and 1950, he hired a young man to work for him. When everybody else says, don't hire that kid to work for you, he says, I'm going to hire him. And the reason why they said not to hire him was because he was black. And during segregation, you, you know, you, he was going to lose money. But he believed the examples of God's word. So he closed on Sundays and he hired a black boy. 
He hired another kid that everybody else said not to hire. He was an orphan. Last name, I believe, was Woody. And this orphan now is the vice president of Chick-fil-A. True and Kathy decided to follow the examples in God's word. And now every one of you here this morning, raise your hand if you had a chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A. That's right. Because True and Kathy decided to start a business that would glorify God. Close on Sundays, hired black kids, and made an orphan his vice president. Because he looked at the word of God and he believed what it said. You know what he did? He followed the bubbles. He didn't follow what everyone else said. He followed what God said. This guy, this guy named Woody, he became in charge of vice president. And he actually said that, that Chick-fil-A decided to start a group of orphanages called Windshape. A group of orphanages here and I think just one in Brazil. He says one of the things, one of the things that this guy Woody would say about kids was this. It's easier to build boys and girls than to men, men and women. It's easier to build boys and girls than to men, 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 uh, men, men and women. You, if you buy a Happy Meal from Chick-fil-A, you don't get the latest character from Disney. You get VeggieTales or focus on the family, this Adventures in Odyssey. That's what you get from Chick-fil-A. This one guy, Woody, there was asked, what would you, what would you say was Kathy's uh, most, uh, greatest verse for his life? And he said the greatest verse for his life was don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. He says, do what it says. And he goes, I owe everything to this man, Truett Kathy. Are you following the examples? Are you following the, bob the bubbles? Are you following what the Hebrew writers in chapter 4 is saying? Look at Moses. Look at David. Look at Joshua. Oh, Pastor, I don't care about that. You don't know what that woman did to me. You don't know what that man did to me. You don't understand the pain and the hurt. I know my heart. I'm going to follow it. And you're going to follow your heart right to hell. I know the statistics came out, through, I'd say this morning, to Southern Baptist and Lifeways Ministries, which is a publishing arm of the Southern Baptist. They actually say, they did a statistic recently, and they said, two things you shouldn't say in church anymore. Hell, hell and sin. Don't say it, because nobody wants to hear it. I'm going to tell you, hell and sin. I just said it. You listening to me? You listening to me? What examples are you following for your life? Everyone's following somebody. The question is whether you're following God's word. Are you listening to me? Pastor, why do I feel uncomfortable? Let me put it out there. Why do I feel uncomfortable when certain things are taught from the scripture? Because the spirit of God is trying to do some surgery in your heart. Surgery? Yeah, all right, let's look at it. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. <clears throat> this part sounds like it hurts. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, and both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Okay, so you follow the right examples, and you got to follow the right surgeon. I've had three surgeries in my life already. Now, I never understood why when you get to the hospital, they do something called pre-op. You know what that is, right? Nowadays, you can do pre-op right on the computer. I did my last surgery I had a year or two ago. I went on the computer, and I, set, I did some stuff on the computer. Now, I never understood why when you get there for the day of the surgery, everybody keeps asking me the same question. What is my name? And I keep thinking, you don't know who I am? Like... You're supposed to cut me open. You better know who I am, right? Like, what's wrong? With you? And then why are you here? I never could figure that out. Like, why? Why do they keep asking me the same question? What are you here for today? Uh, what's your name? You're there. And I'm like, are these guys dumb or something that like they can't remember? The reason why they do that because they want to make sure from you that they're going to do the right thing on you. You know what they say? They say that today there's something like still... I think the statistics say 80,000 wrong diagnosis every year. 80,000 wrong diagnosis every year. Every year. And that is just, you know, men are not perfect, and so they make error. 
You got to follow the right examples. And you got to go to the right surgeon. Don't go to somebody and ask them their opinion about money if they're on welfare. Don't go to somebody and ask them their opinion about marriage if all they've done is destroy marriages. Don't go to somebody and ask them their opinion about how to raise children if their children are living like hell. You're going to the wrong person for a diagnosis. Are you listening to me? God's word is the right surgeon. And the reason why you feel uncomfortable is because God is making a diagnosis. Are you listening to me? And he's making a diagnosis in order so that he can bring healing into your life. Are you listening? For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. That's why you feel uncomfortable. I've actually had people tell me straight out, man, close that Bible. I don't want to hear what, what, what it says in there. I want you to tell me. You know what they're telling me? Don't tell me the truth. Lie to me. But what kind of friend and pastor I would be if I told you what you wanted to hear and not what you needed to hear? See, I, the next four or five weeks, why even bother coming and listen to it? Because what I'm going to do is open the Bible and tell you for better or for worse what it means to be in a relationship. What does God say about marriage and relationship if we don't start with this first, first thing right here? That God's word gives us examples of obedience and disobedience. And when I open it and I share it, it's going to hurt sometimes. But is God giving you a diagnosis in order so that he can remove the cancer, in order so that he can bring healing into your life? If I was to ask you this morning, raise your hand if you know God loves you. Everyone's hand goes up. So why are you not listening to the God who loves you? You know he loves you and he won't do anything to hurt you, but you don't listen to the one who loves you. Pastor, that hurts. That's God. And that's God's, let me read it again just in case. It's on the sign outside. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing. That hurts. I told you, that hurts. As far as the vision of, of, of soul, look how deep God goes. Look how deep God's word, soul and spirit, both joints and morals. I think that hurts. And, and this is the part that's weird. And able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I've had people saying to me after a service, one guy, I was preaching at a church of like three, four hundred. Three or four hundred, there's, there's no way. And I was way up top on like a nice platform. And so there's no way for me to give you straight up eye contact for long enough. Here is, you know, you feel uncomfortable because there's a few of us and it's small. So you think everything I'm saying is, is to you. And I'm like, uh, that's how it is, though, because we're small. But if it was big... You wouldn't really feel that because it's big and you're hidden in the crowd. So I'm preaching at this church, three or four hundred, all right? This guy at the end of it, I'm, I'm leaving. He stops me with anger in his face and he basically tells me, are you, are you talking about me? Are you talking about, I didn't even know who he was. I didn't know who he was. And I, and I said to him, is the spirit of God speaking to you? You know what he said? I kid you not. Never. This was a kind church. He said, never. The Spirit of God never talks to me. Surgery hurts. Even after you've had surgery, you know, there's, I was here a couple times. I had surgery. I came in here, and I had a, a thing on my arm, and it hurt it for a couple weeks, a couple months. I remember the surgery I had with my arm. Because all those years of playing baseball and softball, I tore up my rotary cuff. And you know, so stubborn, you know, I love softball so much. I went another two or three years throwing that ball. I would feel the pain. I would feel the pain so much. It would feel like a knife stabbing me. And I would be like, ah, and I'd just act like I'm okay, I'm okay. Because <laughs> I was so stubborn. And then eventually I couldn't sleep at night. And I eventually went and had surgery. And I remember the guy said to me, this anesthesiologist, you know, this, he was messed up. Right before I went, I was going, I was going to put me out, you know. It's very uncomfortable. You know, they put you on that cold platform. You got a robe on. You're half naked. I'm, I'm modest. I want to wear my T-shirt and my drawers and my socks and everything. And they don't want you to wear nothing in case there's an emergency. You know what I mean? And so, so I'm there with just, you know, 
my skippy's on underneath that thing, and I'm uncomfortable, and it's cold. And that guy, is, and right before he says, he says to me, no more baseball for you. I was like, what? And I went, I went out. Man, that was messed up that guy said that to me, right? But you know what? I, I, I never went to therapy or nothing afterwards. I therapy myself. Why you did that? Well, because I'm Puerto Rican, you know, so I'm a therapy myself. <laughs> right? no therapy. I don't need no therapy. I don't need no therapy. I got it. And I was out there throwing the ball, and it was weak, and it hurt it. It hurt it almost for a few years later. It still hurt it. But I'm going to say my arm strength is better than it's ever been and stronger. But in the beginning, it hurts. And even afterwards, it hurts. Right? Pastor, you read in my mind? No. No, no, no. I'm reading the word. God's Holy Spirit reads your mind. And he's trying to heal you. He says, the word of God is quick and powerful. The word of God is preached. It's read and it makes a diagnosis. Right? It makes a quick diagnosis. The, the, when he said it's a sword, he's not talking about big, gigantic Roman sword. He's talking about the little dagger. The little dagger is for when you were up close fighting. It's what they grabbed when they had no, and it was, that's the knife they used. Papa. And that's how God's word works. So, you know, maybe next week or the week after, um, the title of my message is, it's not my job. And then you're going to have to decide whether what I just told you is from God's word and it's going to hurt. But I'm going to give you the right examples. And I'm telling you, God is the surgeon who performs the surgery. And all God wants to do is bring healing into your life so you can find rest. For your souls, because that's what Hebrews 3, 3, 4, what he says, they found no rest. They found no rest. They found no rest. And he says, verse 11, follow the right examples. Verse 12, it's surgery. Right? It's surgery. That pastor reading my mind. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm reading the word. God is reading your mind. And God's trying to tell you, if you trust him, you have healing. If you trust him, and then see, the, and then the devil comes. He's going to come. You know how many times I've preached through a series on relationships and I've warned the church. And just be ready. Just be ready. As soon as you leave, you're going to fight like hell among each other. As soon as you leave. And I've had people call me up. Pastor, can we talk to you? I mean, it was like 12 o'clock. We just left. 12.30, they're calling me up. Yeah, come on. What's going on? We fight like hell. But of course, because the devil wants to come now and steal the truth of God's word. That's what he does. That's what he does. That word, he's a surgeon. That's, I just read it to you. Verse 12. Sharp, piercing even. I mean, that word is powerful. That's why the name of this church is Living Word. Family. Church. I left church in there because I wasn't going to say center or fellowship. Because a lot of places now get together, but they don't even want to use the word church. I left it there. Church. It's Jesus, it belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Living words, family church. When I got here 14, 15 years ago, uh, uh, one of my friends sent me a picture from five years ago. From five years ago, they sent me a picture when we went to a men's conference. I almost started to cry, maybe because I'm sentimental. I don't know, Pastor Sentimental. But I also was, I felt like, because one of them is in prison from that picture. Another one I heard is an alcoholic that left his family, and another one I heard left his family also. But we were together at a men's conference. What happened? See, I can feel guilty and think as a pastor, maybe I did something wrong. But then I look at it, and that's not what it was. I preached the word. I told them what God said. I told them what God Now, I think there are at least two of them or three of them are in better places now, but it's a shame that they had to go through that. If they only would have listened when the word of came, God came in, quick and powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's quick and powerful. If you only would listen to the spirit of God pricking at your conscience and in your thoughts. God reads your mind. I think my wife reads my mind, but I know God reads my mind. We've had some weird experiences. I'd be thinking something, she says it. I'd be like, woman, what's wrong with you? Reading my mind? Huh? 
But that's what happens to her when you've been together for a long time. It's like you can read each other's mind, right? God is, God is reading your mind, and God is trying to bring healing into your life and into your soul. It's quick and powerful. It's a double-edged sword. God's word is double-edged. That's a little metaphor. It means it cuts on both sides. Isn't that something? God's word cuts on both sides. All right? So over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk to you about parenting and maybe uh, what does it mean to be a parent and relationships and stuff. Please don't leave here hearing what, it cuts both sides. Because I know how it is. As soon as I tell the men what they need to do, the wife will be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's right, you better be doing that. That's right, you better, you better be doing that. Love me like Christ loves the church, don't you understand? And then if I say something about the women, like maybe I'll talk about submit. All of a sudden, the men be like, yeah, yeah, you better submit. And a lot of us who got a little bit of machismo, we take that to the fifth power, and we think that means we can live however we want, and she's supposed to submit. So, no, it cuts both sides. It, 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 it's a double-edged sword. It's for you, and it's for her. It's for the both of us. Are you listening to me? Okay. So are you going to follow the bubbles? The examples of God's word. Are you going to follow the right surgeon? God, the word of God, Jesus Christ. Don't let the wrong person perform the surgery on you. Pastor, so I've had somebody say this to me once. Pastor, I, I feel uncomfortable when you preach. It's like you're not loving enough. You're not loving enough. Man, that's hard when you tell me that. I feel offended. I think I'm loving. I'm trying to be loving. But you, can you imagine if one of my friends who loved me over the summer, I was with some old friends, old school friends. And you know how it is. You know, I'm chilling with them. They getting, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. They getting drunk. I'm eating, I'm eating some lechon. That's my business, amen? But then, you know, when they get drunk, my father says, a drunk person tells you the truth. He said, I said, I think there's some truth to that, right? That's right. So I'm trying to, uh, and one of them says, I love what you do. I said, what you mean? I love what you do, man, preaching. And he's, he's drunk like that. I love what you do, man, preaching that word. It wouldn't have happened if I didn't show up to the party. Are you listening? All right. Now, can you imagine if I said, man, he loves me so much. Ah, and I need his surgery. Right? I need his surgery. And I'm, I'm on that gurney. Is that a gurney? What's that called when you sit in the operating room? I guess it's the gurney. And I'm on the gurney, and the guy says, say goodbye to softball. And I'm out, what? Boom. And then all of a sudden, I wake up for a second. And there's my boy. I love what you do, man. And he's got the instruments in his hand. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do the surgery on you. I'm going to be like, whoa, my brother. Right? I'm not going to let the wrong person perform surgery on me. As much as they say they may love me, if they don't tell you the truth, they don't love you. I think the Bible says something, and I'm paraphrasing. It's better to be wounded by a friend than be, uh, 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 by an enemy. I think it was something like that. Than flattered by somebody. Are you listening to me? God's word it, 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 it performs surgical procedure on you. It's God speaking to you in order to bring healing into your life. Are you listening to me? God's trying to do healing in your life. Amen? You got to follow the right examples. You got to follow the right surgeon. And then I'm going to say this. Follow, this is how I explain it, the right reality. Verse 13. And there's no creature hidden, hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I like the way the NIV says it better. Basically, you're going to give an account you're going to give it a count. God is looking at us. I like what Thomas Okempis said. I don't follow these guys, so don't think I do. All right? But there's a lot of old people who said some good things. Listen to what he said. Let not thy word, O Lord, become a judgment upon us, that we hear it and don't do it, that we believe it and obey it not. You hear it and don't do it, and say you believe it, but don't obey it. That's the wrong reality. To believe that you can continue to live the way you say and not the way God has said and expect God to blink his eyes and act like it's okay. God has built into life consequences. Eventually, if you live the way you want to live 
And God is trying to speak to you. And I don't know when that grace runs out. And I know God's grace are new every morning. But there is a God who disciplines those he loves. John chapter 15, he prunes in order so that we can be more fruitful. And now he's in Sephora, that's some scary stuff. They lied to the Holy Spirit and God killed them. So here he's saying very clearly, the reality is this. You cannot continue to live the way you want to live, ignoring the examples, ignoring the surgical procedure, and not have some consequences because of it. This is what he's saying. That's the wrong reality. This is what Jesus says about unbelievers. He who rejects me and does not receive, does not receive my sayings has one who judge him, judges him. The word I spoke is, is what will judge him in the last day. So there's a judgment coming to the unbeliever. God loves you. That's why you're still living. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's why you're still living. That's why I'm still living. But God is trying to help us follow the bubbles. The right example. The right surgeon. The right reality. He's trying to help us. Why? What does God get out of you being obedient? What does he get out of it? Think about it. What does God get out of you being obedient? Nothing. But God does say when you obey him, you'll be blessed. He wants you to be blessed. Because when you're blessed and you're happy, I believe he's happy. And he gets the glory. Pastor, I ain't going to listen to that. I, I feel uncomfortable. I, I, don't like, <laughs> I don't like what you're saying right now. You're going to leave here, catch me in the door. What are you talking about me? And I'm going to say, is the spirit of God talking to you? Don't be like that guy. No, never. That's blasphemous almost if you think about it, right? Never. The spirit of God never talks to me. Wow, I couldn't believe he said that. And in church. At least he should have been like, oh, yeah, right? But he didn't do that. He was like, never, don't do that. God's trying to speak to you, amen? So God, Jesus says, my words is going to judge the unbeliever. But the apostle Paul says the believer gets judged. He does. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, that's not judgment for salvation, because when you put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. But God don't want you to get to heaven by the skin of your teeth. And then this question about whether you can live like hell and get to heaven. I have a, I'm, I'm questioning it. I'm going to question it. Amen? But there is a judgment coming for the Christian. Whatever you've done. So now the Spirit of God is trying to, trying to talk to you. Through the word of God, and you're going to suppress it. You're going to squish it down. You're going to ignore it. You're going to leave here mad at Pastor Gomez, and I'm never coming back to Living Word Family Church. And I haven't even started talking to you about for better or worse. I'm just trying to tell you about, are you going to follow the bubbles? Are you going to listen to what God has to say? That's why I started it with this message first. Because if, you, if we don't start here with God, let God be true and every man a liar. And that this is God's spoken word. And if you obey it, you're blessed. And if you disobey it, you're chastened. If we can't start here, forget about everything else that I talk about for the next four or five weeks. Are you listening? So there was this lady, 75 years old. Marion, I think her name was Shirtleff. Shirtleff. S-H-U-R-T. Marion. 75 years old. She went to a bookstore. I told you I like books. She went to a bookstore in San Clemente, California. She bought a Bible. It was a used bookstore in San Clemente, California, and she bought a Bible. She took the Bible home, and as she was flipping through the pages, she found a, the yellow notebook paper, a piece of old, raggedy, tore up, ripped notebook paper. When she took the notebook paper out of the Bible, she flipped open the page, and there was her name, Marion Shirtliff. She began to read, and she remembered that she had wrote an essay, and this was it, when she was 10 years old, in order to get in the, the Girl Scout, to, to earn a badge 
for the Girl Scout. She began to shake and she began to cry because that was in Kentucky when she was a little girl. Now she's 75 years old and in California she finds a notebook paper with her name on it in the Bible. She shaked and cried and she can't imagine how in the world did that essay get into that Bible that day. I say it got in there because God wanted her to know that he was speaking to her. Her name was in there. And that's what happens when I preach the word and when we read the word. You think God is talking to you. Who put my name in there? I'm going to talk to you about Moses, David, Peter, Jesus Christ. And when I talk to you about them, you're going to think, is God speaking to me? How did my name get in there? Because God put it in there. And God is speaking to you. And God is trying to bless you, not curse you. But the question is this. Are you going to follow the bubbles? Life right now is disoriented. People don't know what it means to be an adult, a man or a woman, to be married. People don't know what it means. And over the next five or six weeks, I'm going to talk to you about what God says in his word. And the question is going to be when you feel uncomfortable and it pierces and reads your mind is whether or not you're going to believe what God says. And realize, realize the reality is this. When you follow God's word, he'll bless you. When you disobey God's word, he's going to have to chase on you. I hope, you re- I hope you receive it. Amen? Don't miss the next five or six weeks. Don't miss it. All right? Because you'll be blessed. Amen?